We're talking about the theme of users here, and I can think of multiple users. Right? And one of the principles of good design is make sure you understand who they are and how it's working. So who are your users? Is it the affected populations? Is it some vague community in the future? Is it sort of a criminal court legal system? Because that makes very different demands on the data, the sources, the rationale for how you communicate. Sure. Um, is this on? Um, yep. Yeah. So I can, I can answer from our perspective really quick. Um, so at Witness, um, we think about users in a few different ways. Um, we use the... Uh, mostly video for us, we mostly work with video. We use it as, first as advocacy, um, so it's used directly as a tool, normally with a pretty quick turnaround um, that, that people are using it. Um, we use it as documentation and news, which again is a pretty quick turnaround. And then we also use it as, as evidence, as Wendy was talking about. So that is often a much longer time horizon which changes what you need to do as far as archiving and sharing and knowing who has access and who doesn't and things like that. Um, and the other angle of users is, is who's actually collecting it and who we're working with. And we often have direct allies, other organizations, human rights groups. Um, some lawyers are, are a big one. Um, in Brazil, for example, there's this strange network of lawyers and activists and anarchist groups in the favelas and passers-by who get wrapped up in documenting things. Um, and so it's a, it's a really interesting ecosystem to think about how the, the workflows of data come in and out and where they go. Um, and it, um, to steal an analogy someone told me earlier today, it's like a spaghetti bowl. Um, they're all coming in different directions. Yep. I'm in here too. Um, go for it. And there's not an Australian cabal here, by the way. <laughs> I'm actually from New Zealand. <laughs> it's okay, it's okay. Fish and chips, you see? I'm a New Zealander. Um, but thank you, I'll take it as a the compliment. The seventh state, it's fine. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so what I was trying to say a bit more diplomatically in my presentation is maybe um, the end user, if we think of like a series of overlapping Venn diagrams and like the technology for true sector, um, and is there a way we can manage that overlap by kind of pitching for the highest threshold? So uh, I don't know if I'm flattering myself by saying like in the legal space, you know, we have to go through the rigors of testing the courtroom um, and all the verification steps that I tried to explain. So I just wonder if there's like a beautiful way everything can lock together where we can achieve the objectives of some of the other users like Morgan explained, but also not find like at the end of the line, if the user, if the owner, the proprietary, like creative of the material wants to go to court, that there's still the possibility to do that, because certainly if it's beyond the point of creation, if you don't have those legal tests built in, you've kind of lost that opportunity. So it's an interesting design question in a way. So you're saying multiple users? Yeah, yeah, and how to maximize planning so you, yeah. you hit the hardest threshold, which I think might be the, the International Criminal Court. Yeah, just a... Uh, oh. Oh, you wouldn't know it from watching me that I work on a technology project. <laughs> um, just to second what's been said, there are multiple users and, you know, at least from our perspective, there's the users of the app itself, but then also the users of the end data. And these are two different stakeholders. And mm -hmm. so the idea for the app itself, um, you know, there's a variety, as I mentioned, there's actual investigators, activists, journalists, but there's also the regular citizen who might be prepositioned as uh, Morgan said, in the wrong place at the right time. And so those are the users for the app. And what we're trying to do is give them a tool to enhance what they would already be doing with collecting it to the sort of highest threshold that Allison was talking about. And then there's the users of the data, which for our organization is more uh, judicial proceedings, so prosecution, defense, uh, chambers. And so it's trying to merge those two together. So for our Syria map, um, we created it for advocacy reasons. So it's for journalists to use, and our numbers go to the UN every, more, or every month to um, in Security Council reports on UN resolutions. So we're, we created it for advocacy, because right now Syrian doctors don't need a map of where attacks are happening. They need the attacks to stop. So we created the map in, in the hope that it can help create resolutions or enough condemnation that it's going to help it ends these attacks. So an advocacy purpose then, yep. in that sense. Oh. Um, and with Medicapt, um, we have a, a different purpose of using it for, and, and more in line with what Allison was talking about, with, for using it for a criminal justice 
um, purpose. Um, and so in, in that way, MediCaptives is a forensic medical documentation tool to be used by clinicians and then accessed um, by police, lawyers, and judges uh, for the purpose of uh, a legal proceeding. Um, and in that way, the clinician is using it to document sexual violence um, evidence uh, of a sexual violence survivor. So that's how it's affecting the affected, or how it's taking the information from an affected community and in including that in the technology. So that, that's a very different use from uh, the Rodney King video example, which is the everyday technology. Uh, and you, you made a, what I thought was a really interesting point, talking about how do you sort of co-opt existing platforms that people use every day versus build new ones. Um, where do you sit on that from the perspective of the human rights tools? Because, I mean, you look at the videos in YouTube as evidence in some sense, can they be, right? What's needed to make them so, right? The mapping, the maps that people make, et cetera. I'm opening that up, right? Um, and I'm not promising YouTube will do anything, by the way, on this. <laughs> well, we can ask. <laughs> as I mentioned, there are other projects out there looking at how you can take that open source data and authenticate it and verify it so you can use it as evidence. So there's people approaching the issue from that direction. I think what we are talking about is approaching it from the other direction with this point of capture to empower people with tools that can facilitate that open source project and we meet in the middle. Um, but I think, as Morgan said, some of these tools are stop gaps until this type of technology can be more mainstreamed. And then really the value added becomes more in sort of the curation of the footage that's coming out and looking to see if it's relevant. And the authentication isn't the issue now. You know, now you're doing the analysis. So, but in the interim, you know, we're working on these tools that can help take some of the footage that's coming out right now um, and enhance its value. Um, maybe to add to Wendy's excellent points, um, the value of communities and convenings such as this is just um, brilliant within a courtroom context where you are having to um, demonstrate to the judge why this uh, information or this technology is reliable. And if you can show that there's a community that's coalesced around um, certain tools and kind of approve certain methodologies, then you're going to um, give judge, the judge some confidence. And I know that there's been some like industry-wide initiatives to kind of get protocols together, like the GEM standard around metadata, I think, and other things. And these are very useful because just think of it in the context of reasonable doubt. And the defense just has to raise a few questions about how um, your tools were used and developed and if there's any of those um, concerns that I raised in the, in the talk about bias or or uh, the ability for your tools to be hijacked for different purposes. I mean, all these components like go into the mix, um, but having a group like, you know, um, the crisis mappers and convenings like this and protocols or any other guidance that comes out of it is a great way to address that concern. Um, just to add one uh, quick point is um, the verification and authentication of what you're seeing is, is a big thing that we're talking about and working on, but there's other parts of it is finding um, the needle in the haystack, as I said, in a sea of content. There's storing it for longer, per, for longer terms if you're gonna use it as evidence. Um, there's being able to package data, um, whether it's photos or videos or other data points, uh, together to be able to recreate a scene, uh, perhaps. So there's all these other questions that, that companies like YouTube um, can be a part of and, and really help uh, down the line. Okay. I'm going to go to the top question on the, the moderator thing at the moment, which is actually, I think, interesting because we're sort of mixing up the volunteer communities. We had some talk about it and the sort of the, the tools for communities to document themselves, right? And really it's about saying uh, how do you, I'll actually say can you, I'll rephrase that if I can, take the politics out of uh, sort of conflict situations. And part of that is clearly addressed here in the question from the motivation of the volunteers working on this. Right. So I think people within a conflict are very motivated to tell stories right? and professional researchers are very mo motivated in many cases to document them. But volunteers are often, the question here is perhaps less motivated. Um, does anyone who's been working on some of the digital humanitarian network or the, the standby task force stuff talk a bit about that? I mean, I'd look to Patrick but also others who have been part of sort of doing those volunteer works in conflict. Does the politics matter and when does it? 
That's a um, really good question. I'm sure we have other members uh, from the Digital Humanities uh, Network who could speak to that. I think the, the one example that comes to mind was um, when we did something somewhat controversial where we got uh, through Digital Globe, and this was uh, a direct partnership with Amnesty International USA, we got an imagery of Syria, of four key cities in Syria. And the idea was to crowdsource the search for checkpoints, uh, destroyed houses, heavy military equipment, artillery, tanks, and so on. We did it once, and it went very, very well. Uh, I think Amnesty was really pleased with the results, and they came back to us and said, you know, we'd like to do this a second time. And at that point, we were starting to get a lot of uh, colleagues um, uh, telling us, you know, this is, this is slightly blurry. This is a little pushing it, right? And so we just decided as a core team, Standby Task Force, that maybe we were a little, going a little too far here. And so we just, we, we, we stopped and we said, no, we won't do a second one. And the backlash we got as a core team, majority of volunteers just, it was almost a coup d'etat. They wanted to continue volunteering. They wanted to find more tanks and more evidence of destruction for Amnesty International. So it's a big backlash. And so I don't know how to fix that. It's just an anecdote from my own personal experience. So the motivations aren't always as clear I mean, you say the core team made a decision, but the, it turns out it wasn't actually in line with the values that were being of the many so of the members. So should it be yeah. up for a vote? Should we be asking? How do you more? make those decisions? Yeah. Um, so uh, I'm actually intrigued to ask this question in terms of if you've ever seen the Kosovo page on Wikipedia. Right? I don't know whether anyone looked at it when Wikipedia was young, but that page was locked for a long time, but the edit history on the comment page is just insane. Right? And if you look at what actually happened in Google Maps and MapMaker early on the Syria conflict, where some of the bridges were renamed after uh, some of the participants in the original rebellion, if you like, um, it caused the Syrian ambassador to throw a bit of a fit at the UN. Various things happened there. So I'm intrigued in OSM and other sort of effectively collaborative editing spaces that are quite open. Is there any evidence of edit wars? I mean, I'd be intrigued from the, from the floor. Miguel? Yeah, we were, at, I mean, the Syrian example was really interesting because they renamed um, like some of the roads that were after members of the Assad regime of uh, martyrs from the revolution and changed some of the roads that were named after dates of the regime as well. That happened in OpenStreetMap too. Um, because that's politics at work, I mean, being expressed in the conflict in a virtual space. Yeah, and you, space. To, I mean, yeah. And it's, and it, it, you have to kind of admire that um, creativity, but you do, need, you do have a, a principle of things being accurate to what's on the ground. Um, but I suppose similar to Google MapMaker, there's a process that we have in, hmm. in OpenStreetMap when those conflicts come up, some of the, like the islands between China and Japan and the Philippines are subjects of edit wars. And we have a process eventually that if they go back and forth that there's a ultimately someone who has say, which needs to, I mean, we have, we have a principle of on the ground rule, which if you are on the ground, what's the most useful map data for you? And that, I mean, that pretty much aligns with who has control of an area, which doesn't always align with what the international um, recognition or the recognition of particular national entities. We've actually had this conversation a few times today um, outside of the floor where it would be great, I think Google actually does this pretty well. If you are coming from India, you can see the world according to how India sees it. If you're coming from China, you see the, how China sees it. I think OpenStreetMap as well would love to show those, all those perspectives, and then ultimately show the ultimate conflict map. And, but where, where does everyone, I'd like to expose Disagree. those disagreements. You know? yeah. Like we don't, we don't have that, those kind of disagreements visible. So yeah, there are, yeah. that it would. Because yeah. the thing that I get from that is that I don't think there is necessarily a truth on the ground. That's sort of an artifact to believe that there is one unified vision of what this street is called. Because even when there's not conflict, different people call a street by different names depending on who you are, where you come from, your age even, for God's sake, right? Um, was someone else about to make a comment on that? Yeah. yeah, I just wanted to offer some examples from the conflict analysis work that I was talking about. You can imagine if you gathered 
Uh, in our case, we use a workshop of 28 participants that we carefully select to represent the diversity of groups represented in a context where there's conflict. And you can imagine the disparate opinions and the varying perspectives on what the ground truth is. What are the driving forces of the conflict? Who are the actors that have the most power? What, which parts of the political economy are driving the conflict? Um, and my point about that is that if we only open to the crowd and we don't have some curation of the crowd, then we don't have any way of resolving what that ground truth is or even the ground rules of how to resolve what the ground truth is in the case that, that Patrick gave. Um, when you do some careful curation in the form of uh, conflict analysis workshops, we're not the only ones who do it, but and you have put some ground rules that if this is a safe place, we're not quoting anybody, and you have some um, processes. What we do in our workshops is every morning, the notes from the previous day that are all Chatham House, there's no attribution, are printed out, and if they need to be edited at that point, anybody in, in the workshop can edit them. So you build in processes and loops that allow those differences of opinion to be resolved peacefully, those are the ground rules, and you add the validation requirements. You add the please give your perspective with some triangulated um, backup. So there's, there are ways of managing it, but it requires process and a, a kind of a heavy facilitation hand to keep it on track. I guess I'd ultimately sort of expect that there are some processes that can't be resolved. Um, and also the meta question of who decides the process. And if someone doesn't want to opt in, then, then where do you end up? Which leads me to the, the last, the bottom question here. Um, trying to go a little bit by, I think there were some other questions that went off screen, but by the order there, which relates very well, which is that who decides what communities want to create rather than what we give them, right? So again, who decides the curation process that they have? And so this, this really comes to me about saying, here's the tools you could use versus here's, how do we help you build tools that you want to use? And everybody holds up Shahidi as an example of a tool that came out of um, an African context built by Africans in majority initially, right? Um, as, as an example, it's a great success story, uh, but there's also, you know, how does this hold more broadly? Right? Um, for our app, um, I, I think the genesis of it came from one of our trainings in the Congo, um, and this was requested by our clinicians um, for precisely the reasons that I laid out in my talk, but for the infrastructural and the and the practical challenges. Um, in a lot of the hospitals and a lot of the police stations, they just don't have paper and pens. Um, and that's the, that's the ground reality. Mm -hmm. um, and so as we were going there and training them on forensic medical documentation, we would bring the paper with us um, and the pens and, and enough that we would think that would, would take them through the next time we would see them, but it wasn't enough. Um, and so, and then they, they started to understand that we were using technology in all these different ways. And so it actually came from them, this idea. Um, and so how we are thinking about developing this technology is we're constantly going back to them with iterations of the app. Um, and so we piloted an early um, prototype in January in the Congo. Um, and we didn't know we were doing this at the time, but I guess it's called co-design or collaborative design. Um, but that's what we're doing um, and without knowing it. And so we're getting their feedback all the while while we're developing this. So we received all this feedback um, in January and kind of went back to the drawing board and our developers are, are now taking all of their feedback and, and putting it into the technology. So I feel like we're being very responsive to the needs of these clinicians um, and hoping to circumvent some of the practical and, and infrastructural challenges that really exist in the Congo. Yeah. I, one of my old teams, we used to call it inverse incubation, whereby when you incubate something, you draw ideas into a space and you workshop it there and try and create things. And inverse incubation, the idea was to take the team that would do that and actually put them in the place right, and do it there with the participants. And so I'd actually turn to Chris, which is to say that sort of co-design, the research we we're commissioning is, is not co-design in that sense, right? No, and I, I think there's a difference between um, you know, think about platform versus content, so it's part of it. But I think the co create I was thinking just before you said it about the co-creation or co-design mm -hmm. aspect and learning from people about what they need, but also many of these technologies should be thought about as intensely iterative. 
And so not only is the content coming from different places, but hopefully the team is learning and evolving. I think the other is, uh, is to get, and, and this is following up structurally, to get as close to the user as possible, not only in terms of research, but also in terms of just location. So our team on social impact has people in, in I think it's six different countries around the world where parts of uh, the engineering team. And so some of those, like our team in Japan, have evolved things in the face of crises that they and their friends and neighbors were facing, and then that's turned into, you know, into projects. So I think all of those things add up to hopefully make it something where we're not just pushing something out, but are, you know, as enmeshed as possible. Okay. Um, so trying to look at what one of the next questions would be. Um, we kind of addressed a, a few of the few of these things here, but one of it comes down to sort of ultimately the balance between privacy and safety of individuals reporting, and I guess between veracity and sort of reliability and trust in what's reported. Right? Um, you mentioned a bit about that difference between sort of the I can't remember who it was. Someone talked about that difference in the context of the the legal need to expose it fully in a case of in a court versus the need to protect witnesses. And I've sort of helped uh, on human rights reporting on the ground, so just trying to figure out that tension is obvious when you're writing in paper. But digitally, you can't erase like you can paper in the same way. Right? So does anyone want to try and take up that, that question? Because you've all touched on it a bit. Um, but is there anything more to add that we haven't said, I think, is probably worth saying. Right? How do you protect? <laughs> right, well, um, I mean, I think that really is an important issue. And as Allison mentioned, you know, the courts thus far really have been focused on wanting to know who the videographer was, who filmed it, what was their bias. And part of this was coming out of how do we know that we can trust this footage. And so I think what we've been trying to do with some of these tools is really take the filmer out of that equation. If we know that the footage hasn't been digitally altered and we know exactly where and when it came from and if it's unedited, to an extent it can speak for itself. And the idea is we're trying to transition this so that really it's the instance of the app or the technology that becomes the witness and it's the code that can be cross-examined as opposed to the person who pressed record. And so from our perspective, we're trying to not collect any identifying information about the app user unless they volunteered it to us. And so our challenge now is to work with the courts and the other legal professionals to um, develop this concept further and get them to trust the technology behind it. So would the, the sort of the naive analogy I have in my mind is the difference between needing a witness to speak for it, right, and expose them versus having a safe demonstrated chain of evidence that you could then determine the, the content itself is, speaks for itself. Okay. Right. So the idea, you know, in a fair trial standard, we're very concerned about being able to cross-examine the witness. So the mm. idea now is the technology is the witness, almost like a CCTV or something like that. So can you cross-examine the technology or the people who built the technology as opposed to the person? Okay. I could yep. imagine, if I, if I could yeah, ask go. a question, that, uh, the, the, the challenge in many jurisdictions, is, is there a jurisdiction that's on the cutting edge of this? So is there a place to look to as a good example? Um, at the Justice Initiative, we've done a jurisprudence review on this, and the interesting thing is that actually under national jurisdictions, there's the best evidence rule, so you kind of would rely on what's most accessible, and generally that would be the more traditional forms, and you can subpoena witnesses, you know, because you have enforcement powers. So what we're seeing, and it really happened with Libya, the conflict in Libya, that it's the international courts, that are the first ones that are really going to be heavily relying on this material, most likely, because of not having enforcement powers, not being able to have uh, physical access. So the best evidence rule will actually be the technology that the people in this room are, are making. Yeah. So I might actually go to the audience and see if anyone's got a question that's not asked there. Um, our colleague here and then there. Right. Cool. Okay. So I just got oh, back. Could I ask you to stand up as well? Sorry, I should have really? said this. For the, for the folks watching at from the end online, of the day, we're going to do it now. Okay. Yeah, okay. it's the public Sorry. shaming aspect that if we're going to sit on stage here, uh, you can. Okay. Right. Uh, I just got back from New Orleans, and I used to live there, but I'm by no means an expert. Okay. So when I got there, I went to menu pages and I said, I want 
maybe Thai food, Japanese food. So I clicked on menu pages and it showed me all the Japanese and Thai places that were, in ava were available to me. Because I didn't know to make sense of everything that was there of what I wanted. So I see all you guys up there and I see all the talks and everything that's happening. I say, I have a good understanding of this, but I'm not an expert. But it's not just making the mistake of bad food. It's the mistake of where should my fund dollars go for the American Red Cross or where should my time be spent. So when I see all of this, I see a lot of there's this option, there's this option, there's that option, but I don't know which one to choose, so I choose none. So what I want is kind of be able to say, I'm interested in drones, I'm interested in mapping, I'm interested in crowdsourcing, and then I want to take that and I want to see all the options of all your organizations and see what those are so I can start from there. And there's none of that. So I just see all of it kind of as noise and I say, Google, will you please solve this and do something so I can just go with Google. <laughs> so what? can we do as far as like, I'm imagining it being DHN would put this all together in a way that would make me understand like what everyone does and what's the best for us to use with what we're trying to do. But surely that starts with what problem you're trying to solve or what question Co you're trying to ask. Correct, but is there a place right. to find these answers and to filter it out like that as far as organizations are concerned? Does that make sense? Yep. <laughs> yep. Right. Yeah. So anyone else want to take that on? I'm, I'm not touching it right now. <laughs> how, okay, let me frame it slightly differently, which is that how would you imagine someone who's looking to work in this space could discover you, right? Or decide to differentiate between you and another thing that seems similar, right? If a community on the ground was looking to document what's happening to them, right? Or uh, for those who've been working on the volunteering, just, you know, how on earth would someone begin to, to make a judgment about is this something worth participating in? Is this content worth trusting? Right. Well, maybe I could say what I've observed so far is that um, this is very fresh. We're like on the crest of a tidal wave that's about to crash in terms of the intersection between technology and then the uses for kind of a truth orientated um, process. So um, that's why I was trying to, in my early slides, show the different kind of professional sectors that are leading into this objective. And um, from the kind of coordinating role that I play in my organization, I would say that I'm interacting with journalists, I am interacting with humanitarians, and we're interacting with lawyers, and I'm interacting with uh, human rights advocates. So those are the sectors that I see developing, actually, and kind of coalescing, you know, in their own way. So, um, within the journalist um, space, there's a, a bunch of references I could refer you to. Um, the Verification Handbook, which has been mentioned on Twitter a few times already today in the session. Um, Storyfill, for example, is like monetizing verification systems. So that's just to add on to what we've seen here with the, the legal and the humanitarian aspects. Um, and what I'm hoping is going to happen is like slowly now we're starting to see um, components of what I mentioned earlier about like the protocols and like different industries cropping up. I'm hoping that around the tech space that will happen too and then we'll have some like uh, Venn diagram overlap <laughs> which perhaps will be the sweet spot of what you're looking for <laughs> in terms of like some kind of menu of options. It might take so, a couple so more months. Un <laughs> unfortunately there is no standard metadata, no single place where all the tools and projects are published. And there have been a couple of initiatives to build databases of like SMS solutions or health solutions, all of which fall into disrepair because the incentive to maintain them is not there. Right? And so uh, it's, it's ridiculously unfortunate that coming to conferences like this and talking to people is the best search algorithm we have at the moment. Right? Um, and I don't have a quick answer for that, but it's the right question to be asking. Right, as tools become prevalent, because as per one of the things up here, which is the why can't the group that's trying to document medical info in the Congo, DR Congo, use the eyewitness app, right? Um, and it, now it, there may be 10% of the needs for that documentation that aren't met by that, but surely that's better than trying to rebuild from the ground up something. Um, if, if I can jump in with some shameless self-promotion, uh, <laughs> go for buy, it. Buy my book. Um, I mean, well, seriously, buy Patrick's book. Um, I'm in academia, so that's, that's, what, that's what I contribute is knowledge of the... Th so I specifically took on the project of writing a book to try to pull together as many different things as I could. So there's a lot about the crisis mappers. There's a lot about traditional GIS. Esri's in there. Google's in there. Lots of groups and links. 
if, if that's answering your question, you know, there's, there's a limited amount of resources out there, but I think if you look for them, you can find them. And perhaps that's a challenge for anybody else out in academia for public outreach of what, what you're doing here to make it more accessible to, to people that are curious about getting involved. I'd also say that it's not limited to this community. If you've ever tried to look at digital medical health record systems and make a decision about which one to use, which uh, for reasons that are probably not worth going into I was looking at recently, um, uh, nightmare situation, right? Just even at the simplest level there. Uh, Lynn. So with that as background for the Google folks here, how can we get our um, search engine uh, scores up so that if you wanted, in fact, is, is there a simple place to go, I guess my question, to make what you're doing more visible to a typical search that says, uh, you know, credibility of video that would show what you cause what you're doing to pop to the top of a search? I think this goes into one of the questions that we mentioned earlier, which is that how can you adapt existing tools to be more useful for these kind of purposes? Um, so I am by no means some, uh, someone you should be asking that question to with regard to search relevance, right? Um, the core thing, though, is that unfortunately across all the people doing searches, right, uh, and all the people linking to things, it's only a sub-community that is trying to cross-link to each other. So it doesn't pop up in general results, right? And that's the reason why it's the, that's the way the algorithm works, right? And it works for so many situations, it's kind of incredible. But what it doesn't do very well is allow sub-communities to find each other, right, without being very specialised in your terms and how you look at things, right? Um, so uh, I think there's a different story, though, if you talk about can you add a veracity ranking to a YouTube video, right, or some equivalent, right? Because if there is a solid algorithm that's trusted, right, that there's consensus that this does a good job of showing something, that improves the usefulness to the user, right, it's the kind of thing that any company should be willing to look at to say, how does this work, right? I agree more. That's a really awesome idea and something we've actually been trying to work on for the last couple of years um, at the Justice Initiative. And uh, there's just an incredibly intricate framework of legal blocks on trying to get some of these big American companies to engage around these issues, um, not least of which is because uh, America is not a member of the International Criminal Court and has like, got a bunch of legal blocks to any cooperation with the kind of law enforcement angle. Um, but I think, yeah, I know that at Witness you've, you've got a special relationship with YouTube, for example, right, on these points. Yep. Yeah, we're trying to get them to do that, actually. So Hi. thanks. <laughs> thanks. Oh, we are now endorsed by Nigel Snow. That's great. Um, I'll be able to tell everyone. That's fantastic. Thanks. I know the project you're talking on. It's fine. <laughs> I, I wasn't speaking out of turn. Um, I'll get beaten up by certain people I know later. Um, okay. Um, I wanted to pivot slightly, if I could, to the question that came out of a lot of this, which sort of rang from the multiple truths angle. I'm just checking sure that there's something um, up here that, aside from the bottom one of everybody's confusion about picking the right sessions. Um, the, uh, I actually think there's a really important piece. Let's just go to that first one, Morgan, which is around saying, we've only got about two minutes, but if you could be quickly addressed, how do you miss the incitement? How do you deal with the incitement issue? The Rodney King video is the, the consequence of an action. How do, you, how do you deal with the fact that you haven't captured the action? Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, you use Informacam? <laughs> um, no, I, so that's, that's one of the things we're trying to do is, again, you want to be able to verify that what you're seeing hasn't been tampered with. Um, but if you can use metadata, um, it helps surface all the other takes on what happened. Right, um, and so what's interesting is, you know, with with your smartphone, you can. I don't actually think this just applies to video. It would apply to a view on a map or a, anything. Yeah. In general principle, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you want to be able to surface everything else with a video or photo. Uh, you can capture the sensors and tell how the camera moves and where the person is situated. Um, we can capture the Bluetooth and Wi-Fi signals all around you, so we can tell who else was there. And so if you can surface other videos, you can start to piece those together, and we're not all that far off, far off from being able to do that in a 3D scenario, and you can re recreate a whole scene. That's the holy grail. Um, we're nowhere near that. Um, so the that's Panopticon where, exists. And what? The Panopticon exists. Exactly. Um, and so where we are right now is actually just in curation. So we do a lot of work trying to curate videos and trying to find out just 
it, it's always surprised me how much actual sort of old school journalistic legwork you have to do to verify. Like Storyful was brought up, for example. Um, they do this, this, that's their business. They don't have some cool new technology. They really just get on the phone and start looking at maps and start trying to pinpoint where people are. And um, that's where we are right now, is human curation. That's why it's so interesting when you're talking about uh, edit wars and you're talking about all of this, is that it's happening um, with mapping. It's happening with uh, photos and videos. It's happening on, on Facebook and Twitter, where people are trying to recreate these stories and say, OK, here's what happened. And you're going to get 10 different versions. And right now, you just have to do the legwork to try and figure that out. Yeah. There's two uh, projects specifically that I know of. Um, um, one is actually called the Panopticon. <laughs> uh, I had to get a Foucault reference in here somewhere, okay. Yeah. Um, uh, so some of the very big um, computer research centres, um, like the, the guys at Carnegie Mellon, um, have a lot of funding to do some really interesting um, predictive uh, work, which also has a lot of kind of ethical questions around it, but I would check those guys out at Carnegie Mellon University. Um, and then also I was just talking with the guys at the Umati project, which is part of iHub, um, and they're doing a project which is documenting um, like warning words uh, through Twitter um, to pick up signals of potential hate speech, which I think would lead into this questionnaire about inciting incidents. So check that out, um, iHub.co.ke forward slash Umati, U-M-A-T-I. Okay. I'm going to take one question because I've kept him waiting, and then... I have my final statement. Yep. Thank you. Uh, my name is John Sabo. I'm with the Leiden University Center for Terrorism and Counterterrorism in The Hague. And my question is directed at Wendy. You showed us a lot of uh, interesting slides with uh, genuine data uh, weighed against like fake or maliciously uh, generated data. And I was wondering, what is the ratio of that? Um, and I guess I have a two-part question. The ratio of that, of like genuine data, as opposed to uh, data that is manipulated for malicious intent, and what is the level of encryption when you like when you load it up to the servers to ensure that it hasn't been tampered with the genuine data? I mean, right. Um, actually, Martin, do you know if the Human Rights Channel has some of that information on the figures? I don't know the actual statistics between um, how much is fake and how much is authentic. I mean, part of it is not everything's curated. So if you look at the, the millions of videos, it's been estimated that I think there's been at least a million videos about Syria alone uploaded to YouTube, which obviously hasn't all been curated. So I don't know that I could speak to, you know, this fast percentage is, is always faked and this isn't. Um, the clearly, so there's been some high profile faked images, the ones that I showed you. Um, but there's been some that have been heavily disputed, and I think it, it comes to the fore when it may be one of the only pieces of footage you have or one of, of the only pieces of information coming out of, of a situation, and it becomes very controversial, like the Sri Lanka data. Um, so I don't know that I can satisfactorily answer your question, but Storyful or the Human Rights Channel at Witness might um, have more data on that that they can share. I don't know. I don't think we have any actual statistics. I can say it depends on the context. So Gaza was particularly bad. Like the situation in Gaza was particularly bad of just seeing tons of footage that was from Syria or other places in the region, you know, a year or two before. And some of it was just egregious. Like you could still see plenty of things that were, that were really bad. And, um, you know, the point on the fake footage is interesting because it's manipulated footage is one thing and Wendy pointed out some really good examples, but more and more it's just this sort of misappropriated footage um, that comes from completely different contexts, and the, the human psychology of that, of like how you, first of all, make that sort of lie, and then the people who share that is really fascinating, actually, because it spreads like wildfire if it, if it sort of confirms what you're thinking. I know. Sorry. Oh, did you want... I is going to do the encryption. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, just quickly, we've encrypted to a level, the idea is to hide in plain sight, so it's about the same level of online banking, online shopping, the same thing, so it's not going to raise any red flag as it's coming through. Um, and we've also coded it so that large files can be packetized, so there's not something that's coming through that's going to, again, raise a red flag that this is probably a video or probably some sort of image. I I fake all my cat videos on YouTube. Um, you had a comment you wanted to make. Yes. I just wanted to, everybody to know that um, on Sunday um, we are doing a um, self-organized session. And if you would like to share your stories, 
or about your emotional um, impact on the work we do, um, or you have any ideas you'd like to brainstorm, please come. It's um, on Sunday at the 10 o'clock slot. Thank you. Okay. Thank That's you. all. <laughs> okay. I, I had one final question, and I'll sort of put it to Chris if I can, which was that what do you think the – talking about sort of misunderstanding users, if you like, and having people have different stories about the same situation. I'm thinking about the research we did in Jakarta this year, sort of talking to – came in with – I'll be honest, I came in from very strong preconceptions about what uh, – and I'd even lived in Jakarta, right? came with strong preconceptions about what information people would find useful and we built products to serve that and then found some very different stories about the fact that people made their own models from just simply knowing the level of water in a dam outside the city. Right? They didn't need fancy flood predictions because they would make their own interpolations based on history if we just gave them the one piece of data we hadn't even thought of collecting. Right? Um, any examples from you? Oh, anything. Because I'm just trying out. to tag out that this. <laughs> we've heard lots about different versions <laughs> of things. But I want to point out it doesn't just exist in the conflict space, it exists in the natural disaster space in all spaces. Right? Well, that's right. So I think, I think you know, um, apropos of your, your references to, um, you know, post-structuralism, that, that the truth it very much is, uh, is often emergent. People are making it in a community setting. And so one of the things we heard over and over and over is that they want to know what's happening live with their friends, with their family, with people in other places. And so they're turning to any sort of social, instantaneous, real, and they want it to be visual. And they want it to be, but they want it to be in the network that they know. So it's mm. network based with people they are, and they want it real time, and they want it visual. So I think that ties and into many the of the things. The facts what their friends tell them. Yes. Uh, an, another thing which gets to uh, some of these questions about uh, witnesses and veracity of events that, that we saw often in talking to people, not so much in, uh, in, in natural disaster situations, but sometimes when we talk to them about um, violent crises, was. Uh, the, the question of can they use technology or does that just pose more risk? So if they're in a situation where something dangerous is happening and they're seeing it, getting out a phone or a camera or something would then call attention to themselves. And so that's sort of, you know, key in their mind of thinking about that sort of trade-off of, of risk versus their duty to, you know, to their friends and families and their communities. And yeah. so I, I don't think there's an answer there necessarily, but we see that tension with just the users. Recognize that people are conflicted all the time. Okay, I think we're, we're standing between uh, us and everybody's drinks. So I just want to say thank you, everybody, for, for the discussion today and for, for, your, for your talk. So uh, and thanks to the audience.